our Q&A, uh, all about the Live Online Classroom. We're really excited to be here uh, to kind of share with you some of our best practices, some uh, answers to some of the questions you kind of gave us before this even started. And really, look, we just want to let you know we are all in this together. So we want to find a way to kind of just lend their support and see what you can take away with. Uh, we hope this is helpful and that you'll find at least solidarity in some of the questions that have been posed and find ways to move forward. I want to introduce my awesome colleagues here. Uh, first off, Kristen Murner. She's our uh, Director of Instructional Design. She has been just a partner for so many years. I bring all these crazy ideas to her. She is our learning science expert, and uh, she always keeps me honest and makes sure that I'm thinking about you know, she's like, but what about the learning, right? So she always keeps me on point, and that's awesome. I'm so glad to have her here. And then Chris Ryan, who is also just been a peer for so many years. It's been great to work with you. Uh, Chris is our director of product strategy. And so he has just had his hand in a lot of different ways we've implemented. Uh, uh, recently, most recently for a lot of institutional groups, a lot of kind of like, how do we make this work for this specific need? Uh, but again, really excited to have you here as, uh, as well, Chris. I, I want to start with, uh, you know, I know you guys had some initial thoughts, right? Chris, uh, Kristen, that is. Oh, this is going to be confusing. Uh, Kristen, we'll go by that for today. You want to kick us off here? Yeah, sure. Um, hello to everybody. I'm actually coming to you from Vermont, uh, where we got eight inches of snow. You know, happy spring to us. And uh, it's really, I've been looking forward to this all week. I know that this is not the situation that anybody thought they would find themselves in at this point in the semester no matter what level you teach, right? This was supposed to be a journey you took with your students in person, and instead you find yourselves, um, you know, inventing things on the fly and trying to study up and kind of get the best practices you can to get back in front of your students in a new way. Uh, Dennis and Chris and I have worked this way for many years, and we're pretty used to talking to each other remotely and, and have a familiar relationship, but that is not the case when it happens, uh, you know, sort of at the drop of a hat when nobody was planning on doing that. So really excited to kind of listen to your questions and learn how we can best help and share the things that we've learned over the years that we've worked together. Um, you know, this is unprecedented for all of us. And I think it's good to give yourselves grace, give your students grace. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. You know, this is not the ideal learning situation for anybody at this point, but you are the ideal people. And I think that's the really important thing to you know, when your head hits the pillow at the end of the day, you've done the best that you can for your students, just like you did when you were in the classroom, uh, whether you're using technology or school in a bag or however your district is supporting your students, um, you know, your heart for them is the same and you have a relationship with them that's pre-existent. And so just by that definition, they trust you. You are a familiar sort of pillar for them in this sort of wavy ocean that we all find ourselves in in a boat you know we've been joking about it a, a little bit all week like it's a leaky boat right this isn't the boat that we would take to see if we could plan a year ahead of time for our class to be online but now it is we're gonna we're gonna make the best of it and you're the best person to do that so i'm excited to hear from you guys and uh and sort of just have an organic conversation about how we move forward and how we do the best by our students like we do every day that's awesome kristen chris yeah, um, welcome everyone, and I've been excited about this as well. Um, I'm coming to you from Carboro, North Carolina. I've seen some chats go up, uh, uh, raise up North Carolina, and in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we've got lots of different folks today, as you've seen in the chat, from all over. But also in terms of what you're you're coming in with, um, we saw in the pre-registrations everything from. Uh, pre-K to grad school professors and and every everybody in between but everybody's feeling stressed everyone's feeling dislocated and it's okay to feel that way so uh, and just to say we don't have all the answers but we're here to help you so um, so you submitted questions we're gonna get to those um, but back to you Dennis yeah yeah and before we get in there I just want to do another quick round uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us in this zoom webinar i want to give you a couple pro tips so first off when you're in the chat once you found it you'll notice you have a toggle that you can choose who to chat to definitely change that to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your chat you also have another way to talk to us there is a q a button on the bottom toolbar of this screen as well if you hit that and you ask any question we will be looking at that all throughout our session and if we don't get to your question, we will definitely respond to you after the fact as well. Uh, so definitely get your questions in and let us know we can help. One last tip, if you see in the top right, there's an opportunity to hit gallery view. 
If you hit that, you'll see all three of us on the screen at the same time, which is usually the preferred view of our students. So you can check that out and see how that plays as well. Uh, looks like folks are typing in. Again, remember, you want to change it to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your chat. If you only chat to all panelists, only the three of us will see it. So uh, welcome again, Gerard, Cheryl, uh, Dan, thank you for that. And um, let's, uh, let's make this happen. So uh, I want, as Chris said, to answer as many questions as we can. And so again, get your questions in. We have the ones you've already submitted, but if you have questions as this goes forward, we will be responding to your chats and questions as we move forward. So let me just make that clear and set the groundwork for what we'll do today. But I, I wanna start with what I'd consider the basics, right? So maybe we can throw up a quick poll here. I'd love to kind of better understand that diversity of age group that we're working with. So if you can hit the, uh, you know, give us some answers here in the poll, it'd be great to see uh, what you're thinking about. But um, Chris, I, I, I wanna throw this question to you. We do have just, uh, tremendous amount of, you know, like different age groups that we're trying to support here. What is the common kind of like link? Like what, what do we need to consider to set up a, a great online learning experience? Yeah, um, I think of, of teaching online is really an equation of adding together two parts, A plus B. And the A is let's create uh, here and now. Uh, an actual presence just like a classroom. Now it's not just like a classroom that we're used to face to face in person, but we got to simulate that. And we are all here and we're all here right now. So we got to create that. And that's sort of part A. And then part B is in that here and now actually teaching and interacting and that's subject to the tools that you have and so forth. Um, but that's actually going to tap into your teacherliness, your, your self as a teacher is going to come through there and you're going to bring it out of your students too. So you can count on your good experience, your skills, your instincts. They're going to come to the fore. Um, I almost think that it's more around um, how do you create the here and now um, in a few different ways, uh, partly tech, partly others. And then what do you do once you have that to, uh, to, to teach within that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sharing the poll results here so you can kind of see who is here kind of watching. Uh, but uh, I, I love that, Chris, right? To me, it sounds a lot like setting up just the culture of the classroom, kind of the ways of working in which you'll operate. Uh, Kristen, let me throw this to you. Like why, what, can, you, can, you touch, can you elaborate on that? Why is that so important? Yeah, I think it goes back to my initial point, right? Y you have a culture with these students and they kind of expect things, right? They, you have different inside jokes, you have different ways that you set up your classroom. There are different things that you bring to the classroom that makes your space unique. And I think bringing that to online as much as you can, you know, be thoughtful about it and intentional. You know, you don't wanna force it and try to make it, um, you know, uh, just to add stuff to add stuff, but where there are things that really make it relatable for your class, when you can bring those online, it makes students feel at ease. I mean, this really is, so much is upside down and things change by the hour um, you know, in different parts of the country and things are unfolding and, you know, your students are bound to pick up on that stress if they're younger. And then uh, certainly as they get older and move into college and professional where they're juggling things and you might have kids, you know, walking in frame and pets in frame and, and all sorts of things that are not ideal for learning necessarily, you know, giving space for that, bringing in things that are familiar from the classroom and puts everybody at ease. And you kind of move to a Maslow over a Blooms at this point of the game, right? Where you're taking care of the whole student and caring about getting them into a rhythm and a rhyme with how you're going to run things and where it makes sense to be similar to in-person, do that. And where it makes to be, you know, sense to be different, just be honest about that and be open that you're learning too. And I think that really, um, is one of the key things, it, you know, as I've seen this unfold at different age groups over the last couple of weeks, both in my own household and from my friends, you know, they have morning check-ins for even little kids and in kindergartners, and they're all sitting around with their parents. And, you know, the teacher's trying to explain, well, these are optional assignments. And then kids ask what's optional. The teacher cleverly just said, well, that means you ask your mom and dad what's right for you, right? Um, nothing you need to do at a college level, but of course, for little kids, you have to think about that. You know, who's guiding their learning and at what level are they fully responsible to do all of these things? So I think everybody's learning together. And I think just being 
transparent that you're learning too sets the stage that you're going to take this journey together from beginning to end. You know, you started the school year together or the semester together, and you're going to button it up together, even if it looks different. I like that. So what I'm hearing right now is the common link is the teacher, right? And we're going to give you some tips and ways to maybe bring that to the forefront. Um, it's I, I, what I'm hearing is be authentic, right? Be be yourself, acknowledge that this is a crazy time and that there's going to be discomfort. But to your point, I have an eight and five year old at home, Kristen, uh, sorry, I'm still getting used to that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they definitely love those check-ins. They love the opportunity. And I know not every teacher has that chance to do that, but to understand that that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the familiar to be able to make sense of this, the kind of, you know, Chris, we talk about this a lot, but the control what you can control. We talk about that we talked about that even before all this, right? We've been talking about social emotional learning, something we'll touch upon later. Uh, but Chris, you talked to me about an article actually you read uh, just yesterday. You, yeah. You know, yeah. There are a couple of things that uh, recently I've encountered. One was an op-ed by uh, General Stanley McChrystal uh, talking about how the U.S. Special Ops, the Special Forces, moved 15 years ago to being online and they stumbled through it but it's really good op-ed in the new york times from yesterday and they used the language of be visible don't hide be visible go ahead be out there be candid and be compassionate so visible candid compassionate um and i at someone at the who's definitely not u.s special forces in the traditional sense is josh gad right now. Josh Gad, uh, throw in the chat if you know who Josh Gad is. <laughs> G-A-D. He's Olaf from Frozen. He's the voice <laughs> actor. Exactly. And he is doing a nightly bedtime reading, 7 or 7.30 p.m. Eastern time of a little book, eight minutes long or something. And he's just like, I'm going to be here as long as this thing goes every night. And he's done it for over a week or something. And it's glitchy one night. Twitter Live was acting funny and so forth. But he's there. He's visible. He's candid about this. There are times when he gets emotional. Uh, and he's like, I don't know when this is going to be over. And he's compassionate. And you feel it. And so, like, you know, that I think we all as leaders, um, as educators, have that same opportunity and responsibility. I'm going to switch this back as much as I can to the practical now, right? I, I think the takeaway is there's no perfect right now. There's no ideal. Um, as Kristen said at the top of the hour, you are all here trying to do your best, and that's really all that matters. So I guess forgive yourselves in that sense if you feel like there's more you could be doing. You're doing all that you can, and we're going to try to give you, again, as many practical tips as possible. So let me actually kick it to you. You know, we, we try to set up, uh, we've tried to set up online programs for institutional partners for a long time. Uh, what are some of like, the, what's the basic checklist? Chris, let me kick that back to you. Uh, what sure. are some of the things that everyone can do? Yeah, so there's sort of, think of it as in a face-to-face -face classroom in person, you don't have to worry about the sensory channels being open for everyone other than like, make sure there's not a jackhammer in the room next door, you know, or things like that. Like close the doors, make sure it's not too hot, not too cold. Like the that sort of physics and biology of the classroom, you can kind of count on working, right? Uh, the lights, et cetera. You got a lot more setup with, uh, with the technology. And so we just got to make sure the sensory channels are clear. That's reboot your computer. I did that a couple hours ago. Uh, kick everyone else off your internet. No one is watching Frozen 2 for the 10th time downstairs. You got to do some things like light your face up. Uh, I use a separate camera and a separate mic. It's just better than the one built into my laptop. I've done that for years. Um, the better that the signal is coming from me, the better it is for everyone. And you can actually, a little pro tip is to record yourself in Zoom or some other platform uh, just quickly to see, like, does this work? So, um, and you might also notice this, I'll throw in one other thing. To be here now, I am looking at the camera. My sister is now teaching some stuff online and she asked me, you know, give me a single thing to do. And if you're looking at your own screen, over and over and over, you're not looking at your students. Whereas if you look at your camera, which doesn't, it doesn't look back at you, it's this little blank space, but you're actually looking in everyone's eyes right at that moment. Maybe I'm overusing it right now, but I'm kind of trying to make a point. <laughs> so don't scare, like, attendees away. don't scare everybody, like lean in, you know? Um, so I would say, you know, 
look at the camera and set up those sensory channels. I, I do love that pro tip of recording yourself just so you can always put yourself in your students' experience so you can kind of see what they're looking at. Uh, but Kristen, why, why, why all the, like these seem like pretty basic things, but why are we stressing this as like the checklist to even start thinking about? Like what are the, what are the rules of engagement here? Yeah, I think it's all about setting expectations to get off on the right foot, right? If everybody is doing the same thing, you establish sort of a, an, a set of expectations that you model as the instructor in front of your students so that they know how things are going to go. Um, something as simple as getting people to turn on their webcams, which I know we're not doing for everybody here today, but uh, when they come in, you know, that you simply have the established that, you know, you're going to put yourself on mute so we don't have to hear you, you know, drinking your soda and you're going to turn on your webcam so that we can see everybody and you have sort of peer to peer interaction and you kind of model that set it up with an icebreaker or let them kind of come offline uh, or online organically and be able to talk. Um, you know, that's going to be some of the things that they're missing the most. And especially as you're dealing with students that haven't taken online courses before, you have to set that up for them, or, you know, they're going to default back to what they know from social media or whatever exposure they have on the internet in a more quote unquote professional manner, right? Which depending on the age of your students can be nothing, or it can be, we do this all the time for business and I'm in grad school and this is no big deal. So you have a wide swath of people here and how you're engaging. And I think um, you know, I'm seeing some questions in here about uh, preference of platform. And I think, you know, we've used a variety here at Kaplan over the years and sort of have tried our hand at everything. And, um, you know, there's pros and cons to all of them. And it really kind of depends, you know, if you're allowed to make that decision unilaterally, that's obviously quite different than if your district or your school has sort of said, this is the mandate and this is what you use because it plays the best yep. with our learning management system. So I think, um, you, you know, we can certainly, if you wanted to, to ask us sort of different specific questions, we're, we're happy to help. But I think whatever you do, be sure that you can set clear instructions for your students, especially when they're coming from home where a parent might be online or a spouse. Um, I know I just upgraded our internet last week because there are five people now online all the time doing different webcasts and different things. That was not the case before. I worked from home alone. Um, and now I have three kids, uh, a junior high, a high school and a college student all here and my husband as well. So, you know, you've got to be flexible. And I think, you know, it's, it's great to be able to kick everyone off the internet, like Chris said, but sometimes uh, the reality is you got to turn off your camera, set, tell your teacher, you know, I can't do it because, you know, I, my husband is, is on a webinar for work and that's more important than my class. Like you've got to roll with that as an instructor. And I think just, we're all kind of learning how the bandwidth is going to go in this country over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, I want to switch gears. Actually, that's a perfect segue. I just want to kind of sum up and say, there's actually a phrase that Chris and I use a lot. It's called you plus. And what we mean by that is like, if you think about your nervousness and about how, you know, kind of everything that you kind of have to deal with, all these new tools you have to think about, try to translate that as much as you can into just being passionate about the material you want to get across. It may feel unnatural at first, but over time, you'll really just get more and more comfortable with being loud, I mean, that's one way of putting it. Uh, we talk about it being like 120% of yourself is the number that we think about targeting. And you'll see that kind of come across in a really natural way if you keep putting yourself in front of the camera and you allow yourself to make that eye contact that lets your students feel like they are there with you here and now. And then as Kristen said, just invite them to join you, invite them to get practice. Our last blog post last week was all about getting them involved, getting them chatting, getting them using the Q&A, those are the ways that you're gonna create this culture uh, of how we're gonna move forward. And, and we'll definitely answer those platform questions for sure. There are a couple other folks who ans uh, asked those questions previously, so we'll get to that. Um, but first, the first topic I actually wanna talk about is probably the biggest bucket of questions we got from attendees, which is home technology and its challenges. So uh, we got questions ranging from Wi-Fi issues, how realistic is it to expect families to print off massive amounts of assignments? Um, you know, the problem around ink cartridges, they may become as valuable as toilet paper, right? I think we can agree that we all value our eyesight. There was a question about receiving complaints from children around how their eyes hurt from looking at the screen so long, headaches. And there's, some, there's this whole new world that's opened up of challenges that we kind of have to go through. Can I, can I, maybe Kristen, I can come back to you here. Like, what is the, what is the message you'd want to deliver? Uh, you know, I, I, we can try to address each one individually, but you know, what, what's, what, what comes to mind? What are some of the, I know you kind of touched upon already, so maybe we can continue that thought. Yeah. I mean, I think there's just, there are challenges that we haven't even anticipated yet. Right. And I think 
that's the key. We can only control so much. Um, just like in the classroom, things unfold organically. And, and maybe after many years in teaching your same classes or your same age group, you kind of have a good idea of what's going to happen from moment to moment. But we all have those days where you're kind of broadsided by something different. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot of those things happening <laughs> moment by moment. And flexibility is going to be sort of the the new currency, I think, in teaching. And, and it always has been, but I think even magnified now. Um, you know, certainly when you have the ability to take them offline and give them um, an activity that they can do that doesn't focus on technology, that's going to give them a break, whether it's their eyesight or their cognitive load or just the monotony of sitting at a desk, which you try to mitigate in the classroom if, when at all possible, right? I mean, hands-on learning is where we want to be in project-based learning and experimental learning and those things that are harder to replicate in certainly a, a lecture scenario like this, even when you're chatting, um, you know, there's a ton of technology out there that uh, that that has shown up, right? And I'm sure you guys have all been bombarded with solicitations from different companies saying, we've got a solution for this, we've got a solution for that. And you could literally throw a new technology platform at them every minute of every day. And I wanna encourage you not to do that for a while, right? Get a hold of the tools you have to use, right? You have to get face-to-face -face with them when you can. And this is the best way you're gonna do it, whether it's Zoom or WebEx or Google Hangouts or Meet. Um, you gotta do that. You've gotta have somewhere for them to turn in materials. You gotta learn how to do that. Get familiar with a few things. And then just like you would do in the classroom when you get a new curriculum or a new asset, introduce it gently and have fun with it and let them know it's uh, you know it's an experiment for everybody. We're gonna try this, we're gonna see how it works. Um, you know, Use some of the tools that you've probably used in the classroom like Flipgrid where you were introducing technology gently um, some of the sort of proven platforms that you've shared with other educators over the time. This is a good time to see how they play online as well because you've already had your hands on them in the classroom. Yeah. If I can jump on that, um, it's sort of the flip side of the 120% of yourself and bring that energy and channel it through the, the, the tech tools you have. Um, think of the opposite number, 80%. Um, you can probably cover about 80% of your material or 80% better said of your learning objectives. You're gonna to have to cut some, or you're going to have to accomplish, you're gonna to have to do fewer problems in it's the practice. You're just gonna to have to be more intentional. Um, that, that number actually, um, uh, a colleague of ours um, recently just wrote about that. Like she's been teaching online for five years, very experienced and still when she teaches online, she consciously says, I'm gonna do 80% and I'm gonna break it up into smaller chunks and make them achievable and have interaction around each one of those things. Cause there's just too much that's pulling away from the here and now. As best you try to set it up, it's, it's not the same as being in person. So conscious, it's kind of along the same lines you were saying, Chris, of um, you know, choose your tools and choose the things you're gonna introduce. Likewise, choose the actual learning objectives uh, and how you're gonna choose, how you're gonna achieve them uh, even a little more judiciously as you move your lesson plans online. Makes, it makes sense. Um, I, I, it makes a ton of sense. And, and, and maybe the last point I'll make is again, stay in touch with your district. I think that's uh, just, you know, the digital divide is, has been a known issue. And so um, kind of think all put, all put all that together. But actually, look, listen, we've had a little mutiny in the chat while this all this has been going on. So I think it's time to maybe move off this topic real quick, get into platform and come back. I think that's if we're, you know, we better practice what we preach, right? So uh, a lot of questions about platforms. So I actually want to bring up a poll. How many students do you teach at one time? Because that is definitely a big kind of, uh, consideration when you're picking platform. It's one of the reasons why we've had just a lot of different practice with different platforms throughout the years, because there, it, there is no one size fits all, right? I, I think each platform has its own strengths. I, I would say the underlying um, theme that I would throw out there that I've been saying to myself for years is go where the students are. Uh, it's one of the reasons why during this time we've actually started broadcasting free AP prep on YouTube Live, right? We know where the, that's where the students are going. Their traffic has jumped immeasurably, as you might imagine, over the past uh, couple, you know, couple weeks. Uh, Twitch is another place where we're trying to get some more broadcasting. We're trying to get into Discord chat. If you don't know what those platforms are, definitely take a look and better understand them because that's what students are using. And the more you can kind of make things comfortable, the better. 
Uh, that being said, you know, we've definitely heard from students like, hey, get out of my Twitch, right? This is for gaming, not for education. And so I, I think there's a balance to all things. And it's not a need that you do that. It's more of a consideration as you think about the different types of platforms you might use and how easy it is for your students to use them. So uh, I'll, I'll let me go through real quick through the different platforms as uh, kind of we see it at Kaplan. And then maybe we can dive into some of the particulars. So, um, you know, Kind of Kristen and Chris both talked about this briefly at the top about having your students turn on your webcam. So in a small, intimate environment, I would say no more than 15 students. Zoom is a very, very wonderful platform to look at. Um, it, it, you might have seen in the news a lot, right? It's, 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 I would go as far to call it the linchpin of in-person to online education transition in today's world. Right. It's it kind of emulates as much of the in-person environment as you can. It's clean. Uh, you will have the least AV issues um, and, and the way that I, I can get into technology about the kind of the peer to peer plus cloud based. But like the way it does the conferencing is unparalleled. Right. So I'll throw that out there right off the bat. And it's a it's a easy download away. And I think if you're part of a school right now, Zoom is giving away a lot of uh, school licenses for free. So it's definitely something I would look into. Um, if you're looking at a place where, uh, you know, a lot of students already have Gmail, Google Hangouts can be an option. Uh, but that being said, definitely look into the number of people who can join concurrently. It can vary depending on, I forget the last time I checked what the personal license of Google Hangouts can offer you, but you can definitely look into Google Hangouts. And um, again, that kind of goes along with the theme of, hey, go where your students are. Uh, so. I, I will also add for our classes that are over 15, uh, online classes that is, we use the We Connect today primarily. And the reason for that is because it does one thing that Zoom doesn't do as well. And that is, oh, it looks like most people are in the 11 to 50 range. Maybe we should tweak that a little bit to match. Uh, but if you're in that range, um, definitely try Zoom. If you've got towards the lower end, the connection is just, you can't beat it, right? But what Adobe Connect offers is an opportunity to really get into what we've dubbed as multimodal communication. And what I mean by that is like, we saw a question come in, hey, how do I connect with my students individually? And it allows you to do polls and private, mostly private chatting, I think is the biggest thing. So I don't know if this is in your budget or even a possibility, but what we've done at Kaplan, we never put a teacher alone in the classroom for some of the larger classes we put them in there with a the team of teachers. So you might notice in the chat, I have a couple other instructors who are actually chiming in and helping out, uh, Katie being one of them, Dan being the other. And then it would be kind of a setup where you have an off-camera instructor, a chat instructor, really be able to engage with students beyond what you're doing on camera. So if that's possible with like a TA format or, or maybe it's another peer that you can team up with and really either take turns um, supporting each other. That may be something to look into potentially. Um, but there's definitely other solutions as well. So I've talked a lot and honestly, I'd much rather hear Chris and Chris. And talk, so. Dennis, I just wanted to kick back to you. So like, yeah. for instance, think of this poll right here. If there was something, you know, for the 2% of you all um, or adding it up 7% of you all who have over a hundred, imagine having a TA uh, who is separately because we can actually see behind the scenes who those folks are and imagine over the next period of time that TA reaching out privately to each of you to say, hey, you know, send us your, like, are you cool with us digging up some more information on how to teach 100 plus and sending it to you separately? Like that kind of like reach out that can be very poll driven or response driven in the moment. It's actually something that I would say is arguably better than is easily possible in a face-to-face -face in person class, at least not how most face-to-face -face in person classes. You can actually through this kind of polling and then TA follow-up do some amazing things. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And Kristen, I want to kind of maybe bring it back a little bit, you know, take us out of the platform for just a moment, see if new questions come in and see if we can address them. But you know, what are some of the other practices we can do to really like we had a question that came in of how do I keep online engagement if I have over 500 students, right? Well, right. you know, what, what are some of the things that folks can do here? Yeah, and I and just to go back to a little bit about buddying up with someone, you know, I think um, in corporate training, they'll call that facilitation. You know, here we call it off-camera teachers, but 
essentially it's more than doubling your bandwidth, right? Because when you're teaching, you're already at max capacity, right? Because you're looking at the camera and you're looking at the engagement and you're really trying to say, do I have this thing queued up and is my slide, what comes next? Like your brain's on overdrive and, and especially when your kids are around your feet, right? <laughs> so it's just a lot to think about right now. But if you are able to buddy up with another peer and both of you be in each other's synchronous sessions, you have somebody who can monitor the chat. And where we have seen this really be a huge benefit is in large classes, you know, to your point about the question of what if I have 500 students? When we have very large classes, we staff up with multiple people behind the scenes, which may not be practical, but even having somebody back there to give one-on-one -on -one support to somebody who may be too shy to raise their hand or ask a question publicly because they feel called out, we will see them oftentimes engage in private chat where they'll say, I'm just completely lost. And so while the on-camera teacher can continue their lecture, this person can kind of pull them off to the side and say, hey, you know, you missed this foundational concept. Here's where it is. Um, you know, or your teacher will get back to you or whatever. They kind of triage the situation and get the student to a point where they feel comfortable, you know, then re-engaging in the lecture and they don't feel called out for not knowing the material. So that has been um, a, a benefit. And we've had uh, many classes that used to be in person move to live online after seeing that experience with their students, especially students that struggle, right? And that's where we always get nervous. You, know, you have 500 students of which, you know, some of them are on IEPs, some of them have extra needs, some of them are slower. And how do you give that personal attention? And I think really being able to leverage having another human is your best bet. Um, where you can't do that, you know, some of these platforms will have breakout rooms, but then you have to have people to facilitate in there and you have to be really planning ahead for that. Um, that's kind of like uh, AP online meeting running, right? To be able to do uh, breakout rooms. But I think being able to do a lot of interactive stuff within the platform. So somebody asked about how did you get that fancy poll? A lot of the different platforms will have some sort of engagement tool. Sometimes it's a thumbs up, sometimes it's um, you know, polling and, and sometimes you wind up using a third party polling software like Poll Everywhere is, an, is one that we've used before where you can create word clouds and you can do, um, you know, it'll make graphs and it'll do all sorts of amazing things for you on the fly and you capture that data as well. So even if you ask them where they're struggling and, it, you know, and you're trying to kind of understand open ended questions, those types of software packages will enable you to gather that information from your students when there's a large group of them without going around the entire room, which you obviously can't do once the group gets so big. Um, you know, even when we asked you guys where you were from and you, and you quickly put it in, it scrolled so fast. You know, I saw Alabama flip by, I saw you know, different states, but you don't get the actual content. So I think polling and, uh, and being able to use the interactive tools really, um, really helps. I think also, I noticed a lot of you are, are teaching from the college and high school level and there are oftentimes learning specialists that you can leverage. Those folks right now are probably pulling their hair out like all of us, but they really wanna help you use the tools. And um, I'm sure some of you have used them before. Some of you, this is new and you're just getting started. My guess is many of those people have put up resources on your school's intranet or, um, or are leveraging learning centers within a university where there are some resources there they will bend over backwards to help you by and large. Um, I like to consider myself one of those people <laughs> and just work in a different environment. Um, so please try to find out the most you can about your tools. There's a lot of great resources and a lot of other people, um, instructional designers uh, included, that have put up resources in YouTube and other places. Uh, a lot of them are on Twitter. Go for a search on things that you really want to learn about. My guess is there's somebody out there that already is so excited about that that they've created a whole blog about it for you. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I I love that. In fact, I'll you know I was talking to a peer out west in one of the big universities, and they were saying they wish more teachers would reach out. Like they're completely in the online department, and you know they they are waiting to support you. So definitely look for opportunities to do that. And I always forget how far away you guys actually are. It always feels like we're much closer. Uh, well, the well here's the thing: is that imagine we were in a lecture hall, right? Yeah. We would be, or even in a conference room. We would be far away, but but in a way, the visual we are away is like the distance between my nose and the and the, that whoa too close camera too right close. there. I know, like whoa, whoa too, too close, distance. too close. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> six feet. We're not six feet apart in some sense. It's kind of uh, interesting. I think of a really good online class is sort of feeling like a seminar, like we're all sitting around kind of this virtual table, as opposed to someone like you know the Sage on the Stage classic thing. Yes, you're all. Maybe you have a slide up with a thing you're looking at together or working on, but it's as if you're all sort of sitting around it together. Um, and there can be some creative ways. I've seen where there's some immediate interaction tools like, okay, everybody grab the laser pointer 
you have to train people on here are the tools you have in whatever medium you have, but you grab the laser pointer and hover over the state you're in. And so I've seen these maps of people all over the country with like little flickering fireflies. And it's really cool. That is really hard to do in a face-to-face. -face. So there are actually some things as you explore it, where you say, oh, you can find out some data in real time about your students online better and faster than you could face-to-face. -face. And that's gonna feel really good when you tap into that. Yeah, that, that just concept of community and collaboration is key. So at the most basic level, study groups is definitely something you can consider. Uh, if you can get them to happen organically, great. So find a way to get them in some kind of chat, like Slack is very popular these days. I mentioned Discord earlier. Uh, Facebook groups can work for this as well. So giving them an opportunity to engage with each other uh, could be great or just split them off and force them uh, if you're, you know, if you're already kind of in some of these university programs, you may already have teams of students. So make sure that they are out there collaborating and connecting uh, through whatever medium is most comfortable to them. Uh, and then the other thing I would maybe throw out there as advice is something we've learned is like when you're teaching online and you're worried about engagement, uh, as kind of Chris mentioned, lecture style isn't like I would say the most dynamic way to approach it. I know we're doing a lot of data kind of download to you guys right now, but as much as you can think about how many workshop style, uh, collaboration style uh, work you can kind of fit into it. Meaning, can you review questions together? Is it, can you do less lecture about content? You know, is there an opportunity maybe to record a video of yourself that the students can watch on their own time and then kind of kind of build off of that in a lesson. There are things you can do to play around with how they're approaching the material that they're looking at. And we can look into that uh, and talk about that a little bit. Oh, if I can jump in, yeah. um, I saw something go by in the chat where someone was doing kind of the virtual coffee hour of like giving an assignment and having people work for an extended period of time online together, kind of alone, uh, what is it? Alone together that we all are. Um, that works really well. That can create, as long as that's targeted towards some outcome. Um, and everyone's got their mute on, but their camera on maybe, or just, Hey, we're all here present. And then you come back on and 10 minutes in or 15 minutes in, um, there are ways to create space for thinking. And I loved, uh, who, who wrote that. That's something that we do too. Okay. I'm going to pause right here. I want to hit the Q and a real quick, uh, cause we've got some questions parked there and I just want to address them, uh, real quickly here. Um, so I'm going to answer this one live. It will be recorded and we, uh, Dan, you can keep me honest here, but we'll definitely provide it and it'll be available to view after the fact. And we, you know, we definitely want you to be able to share this. Um, uh, this one's, uh, from Debbie is a great one. Chris, you get, you bet us that there would be a questions about assessment. Uh, we said that this would be scope creep, but we will touch upon it briefly towards the end of the session. So hang tight for sure. Um, uh, I don't need to keep engaged. I have, I'm having to create online class for over a hundred oncoming new nurses. Oh man, uh, Rosa, we will definitely reach out to you. I think this is a situation, I'm not gonna make this live, but I would love to reach out to engage with you after. Maybe there's something we can do to support you and help you with. Uh, Valentine gave us a nice compliment. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, you're saying you could do video chats, then just pre-record. Um, I could see, yeah, there's, there are a lot of features like in terms of how this works. This is a Zoom webinar room. It's different from a Zoom meeting room. So Zoom meeting room, sorry to make things confusing. I guess that's what tech does sometimes, but Zoom meeting rooms do not have this Q&A function. So they only, and you can actually take away the polls out as well. So you can literally just have the camera and the chat. Right, like that's that's all you, all you can have up, and I think you can definitely change your options in the chat to turn that off as well. Same for Adobe. One thing that Adobe does too is it actually lets you choose what layout students are looking at. So in other words, you can bring on only the tools that you want students to look at. In fact, focus is a is a big topic that we'll be touching on in future blog posts as well, because that is one of the big things that we always think about attentiveness in an online classroom. Um, so. Thank you, Tyler, for that question. Uh, absolutely. Um, prefer no video? Yeah, uh, Aaron Snow, this is a great question. Actually, I'd love for you guys to touch upon this because this is a debate, right? Like, it's great having students on camera for the teacher, right? Because I'd love to see you guys interacting. I'd love to call you. I'll keep you accountable. 
But what what is the, can we touch upon that for a bit, Kristen, maybe you can take this one. Yeah, I think it also bleeds into the next one that says, how do you track attendance, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, if, yeah. <laughs> if they're there, they're looking at you, you know, they're there. Um, and I, I think this goes into, like, there's multiple levels, right, to, to this, this person's question, because maybe they don't have a webcam uh, that works well. Maybe they are in a situation where they don't want to show their home life. Maybe, you know, there's things we need to be sensitive about there. Um, but in general, if we, if we get rid of all of that, which you can't always do, and you say, they're a high school student, they don't want to be on video because they want to be like also playing their Nintendo Switch in their lap while they're sitting here. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the more you make it engaging, the more you're able to do polling, the more you're able to kind of ask them throughout to engage, that's your attendance tracking, right? If they're answering polls, if they're answering questions, if they're in the chat, you know that they're there. So that, that does kind of two things. It keeps them engaged, hopefully keeps them learning. It also, um, you know, I don't want to use the word formative assessment because that's, it's not truly formative assessment, but like little litmus tests that you know that you're on track and they're tracking where you want them to be in terms of your objectives um, and your standards and your content and all of that stuff. Um, but I think where possible, the video camera is, your, is a friend, right? Because they're missing engagement right now. I would understand if they saw each other all the time and then they were asked to be on video, that would be less interesting to them. But this is the form of social engagement that we have now. This is it. It's your family and it's your webinar. So I would encourage you to try to set that as an expectation and see how it goes. I'd love to hear from you in a week or so and see if you've got them, you know, feeling like it's a safe place to engage. Um, you know, and if you have students that you know are in an area where they may not want to show you for those earlier reasons where it's personal, try to reach out to them and try to see if they can set up a space where they feel comfortable. And if it just isn't going to happen, it's just not going to happen. But I think having them know that you're there with them also may make them feel more comfortable in coming on camera if it feels like everybody's engaging in the same way where they can. Yeah. I have an email box that I actually personally, you know, I'm looking at daily. It's live online support at kaplan.com. If you want to talk to any of us, you can always throw an email there. I'll make sure I get a response in. So that's another way you can communicate with us. We're not as fancy fancy. We don't have an Instagram or Twitter up yet, but we probably should work on that. Uh, so again, going along with the go students, go where students are. Um, the last point I'll make here is just make sure your students are comfortable. I, I think we've talked about that earlier, but it's like, you know, if students are not comfortable, that's, that's one of the things that are going to deter them from getting what they need to from any given lesson. So um, I've had a lot of times where I've worried about students who didn't engage at all with me, who didn't chat at all with me, who didn't do any of the things that I would have thought of as like the things that students need to do to be successful online. But yeah, I'll email me after and say, thank you so much. I'm like, thank you for what? You, all you do is watch me like I was a video, but they get what they need to out of it, right? Like every student takes what they need. And again, I just want to reiterate, you may be feeling like you're not doing as much as you need to, but just being there, just being present in the here and now is, is a huge step. It's a big first step, just being in front of the camera and making sure students know how much you care about them and how passionate you are. I, I just want to kind of make sure you leave with that thought as we move through this. Um, how did you do the online survey that you did? How many students? Oh yeah, this is a feature uh, that you can set up in Zoom for polls. Uh, polls are something that you can set up. You have to configure it. So there's a little playing around. If you Google, how do I do polls in Zoom? It'll definitely pop up there. Like a ton of articles that you can look at there for sure. Um, uh, Roberto, uh, I will respond to you later in regards to content ready material in the medical field. If you feel, if you want to reach out to that email I just talked about, or we can reach out to you after that works as well. If you want to give us specifics, uh, Robert Reynolds. And, and if you guys are wondering where this is coming out from, if you hit the Q and A on the bottom, there's, it looks like more people are using it now, now that I'm actually responding to them. Surprise, surprise. Right. Uh, but can you shut off students mics in zoom? You absolutely can. So that is one, you know, it would be a nightmare, I think, to just have live mic all over the place, especially with everything else is going on. Um, but you can definitely do that. Um, I will warn you, you can't really control the chat, though, in Zoom, right? So uh, you can't clear the chat. You can't moderate the chat. So if some student starts popping off memes or whatever the case is, uh, it, it may, you know, the, you have, you'd have to think about that in a different way. You could actually turn off chat, uh, but it's either all or nothing. Um, in, in Adobe, you have a little bit more control there. You can clear the chat and get everyone to refocus again or just pull the chat off completely. So that's maybe something to just play around and practice beforehand and for like uh, mitigation, right? 
um, Zoom meeting versus Zoom webinar. I would just say Zoom meeting is more for like conducive to like everyone on camera, kind of like Chris talked about earlier. Chris, maybe you want to touch this, touch upon the Zoom meeting versus Zoom webinar. I don't know if you have some preferences there. Um, no, at, at, or, or which Chris, um, here we are doing the Chris thing. Ryan, Chris yeah. Ryan. Yeah. So, um, the meeting is more like a webinar, uh, or, I'm sorry, it's like a, a presentation kind of, uh, uh, well, no, other way, other flipping way. it around, yeah, flipping yeah. it around. Thank you. Uh, webinar is more presentation mode. Uh, meeting is more like, and, and the thing is, is that Zoom is kind of this general purpose tool in general. Um, that is being, well, repurposed for teaching right now. And so some of the other platforms that we've used over time, like for instance, referring to Adobe Connect, I'll just say this, like there are, or Blackboard Connect, uh, Blackboard um, uh, 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 Illuminate was something that I've used too, uh, which then became Collaborate. Point is that those were built sort of purpose up for being a classroom. So had some things around chat that were, uh, a little bit more geared towards what you might encounter in a classroom. Um, but the differences are not large. I would be hard pressed to actually like nail them for you. Uh, so I'm going to kick it back to you, Dennis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, the only thing maybe I'd add is, uh, if I may reiterate, I, I think plus one to everything you just said, the biggest advantage Zoom brings is a really crisp and clean AV, right? So in a situation where you want people on camera, and you want to be able to talk to them. Like Dan mentions in the chat, meeting can hold up to 300 people, but you're not going to have 300 people on camera, right? Which is why I kind of set that soft cap of up to 15, because it can get unruly at times um, if everyone's on camera at one time. I mean, you can try it. We'd love to learn. We are always testing the boundaries. We want to learn more. We want to, I'll say this, from a personal standpoint, Zoom is kind of really, like a lot of people know what Zoom is now. So I want to leverage that because I think online learning is something that is uh, kind of misrepresented or not really understood and people are being forced into it. So I'd love to take that new forced comfort and do something to kind of push the boundaries in terms of how we educate students online. So that's maybe in mind. But it's a great kind of flip to Tyler. This is a great question. We have students with no internet. Which one, who wants to take this? Kristen, Chris, who, who wants this? How do I engage them? You know, this is hard. And um, Tyler, would be interested if you stick it in chat, what age group that you're working with specifically. Um, my daughter is actually an ed major in college right now. <laughs> so now struggling with student teaching hours, right? There's a new one to think about. Um, but she has been putting together school in a bag for her students because they have a lot of migrant farmer students um, you know, whose parents don't really have a home. And so there's no way they can do online learning. And so they've been putting together lessons that are um, associated with standards, but not any specific weeks um, activity at this point when they started out and, you know, they'll dial it in a little closer as, as it goes out and, and they realize that the school year is not gonna unfold as they thought. Um, and I think, oh, so you're middle school. Um, yeah, that's really tricky, right? Because that, that also isn't the worst case scenario in a way because those kids don't necessarily know how to engage professionally online yet. So you have to teach that as well. Um, but I think um, old fashioned ways of, you know, you could do conference calls with them if they have phones where they can call in. You know, you can use any type of phone to do that. That can uh, be a new way of engaging in different things just so they can hear each other's voices. Um, you could start a pen pal program, which sounds really old fashioned at this point, but actually there's something really amazing about receiving something in the mail, um, especially for that age group. It feels very novel. They don't get anything. And I think, um, you know, trying to be mindful of the fact that, you know, they need to hear from you. And so being creative in the way that you engage with them however you're able to do that, um, leveraging whatever technology they may have, right? And, and to my mind, that's going to be probably a phone, right? Like some sort of, um, you know, hopefully some sort of internet-based phone, but if not, you know, regular, I would say that would be something new and exciting to try for them. I'm sure they've never been on a conference call before with their peers. Um, yeah, something I'd throw in there, uh, that's, this is a tough one and the digital divide is, is widening. Uh, I just heard from another colleague whose um, uh, son in a first grade, they're having like half an hour uh, check-ins with the teachers. There are all these pre-recorded lessons that it's very technology enabled school all the way over to the public school district that my colleague used to teach in is basically doing very little, if anything for students who do not have internet access at home. And yes, we're hearing free Wi-Fi and we're gonna to try to cross this. Um, 
we don't have the great answers. Um, but to build off of what you were just saying, uh, Chris, I used to manage someone uh, from afar, from here in New York or here in uh, North Carolina. I managed someone in New York City, and he could work pretty independently. Uh, what I had him do was send me at the beginning of the day, um, what do you plan to do today? And then, and he would just send me an email. And at the end of the day, he would, he would say, here's what I did today. And we even cut that back to, here's what I accomplished today. And here's what I plan to do tomorrow. That didn't have to be email or doesn't have to be email. That could be here. You're keeping a journal and you're going to set goals at the beginning of the day. And then at the end of the day, you're going to evaluate them. This is a thing we know from learning science, and I'm stepping into your territory, Chris, but correct me, um, that metacognition about what you did, what were two or three lessons you learned, and what have I planned to do tomorrow, setting the goals, uh, reflecting on what you learned and setting new goals. Um, that is a great overall skill, and it leads to better results overall. So those are things that we should all be exploring, too. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Really great points. And uh, Kristen, I saw your chat. You want to hear any other ideas that folks on this call might have for engaging without technology for middle schoolers. So if you guys can support yeah, yeah. each other, we'll love to throw that out there. And then guys, last word on Zoom, like this definitely is not meant to like show our preference for one platform. It's just an example. I see Microsoft Teams came up in the chat. Definitely check that out as well. Um, you know, yes, the free version of Zoom has a limit on how long the sessions are, but you can, I think, I forget what the subscription is for the pro license, but it's only one license per teacher that you need to be able to host it. Anyway, you guys, uh, we can talk about that. If you guys want to message us and if there's something we can do to support further, we can definitely give you more technical expertise, but we really want to focus on as much as we can, just like what are the practical steps folks can take other than go out and buy a thing. Uh, this is all just to meant, you know, is meant to be supportive. Uh, you know, you can definitely track attendance for big groups. That's something you can go on Zoom's website and take a look. Um, I do want to, uh, you know, I just talked about buying a thing, but uh, there is a question about iHuman nursing. Uh, so, uh, Kristen, you, you, we had a question before that was asking about this, right? What was that question? I'm trying to look for it. Oh, nursing student needs, right? Would you want to touch upon this briefly and where they can go for more information? Yeah, yeah. and I think it was put in the chat. I believe I saw that in the GoTo webinar. Yeah, Katie had put that in there. Thanks, Katie. Um, so uh, we have a mid-fidelity simulation product called iHuman Patients, which allows for um, for you to interact with a, a virtual patient and you go through um, and ask them questions, the patient responds, you different, do different clinical uh, physical assessment from head to toe. And there's a ton, a ton, a ton of analytics that faculty get back. And certainly with clinical rotations being scrapped for now, this is the way that you can get the data you need on everything about how your student is assessing their patients clinically, both for nursing and for medical students. And so there's a webinar tomorrow morning um, at nine o'clock Eastern, I believe that iHuman is hosting and it is actually a coronavirus case that they have um, that they have created. So it'll be timely, it'll be really important. And so if you're in the medical or nursing fields, I would encourage you to go listen to those guys. They're brilliant. and. Um, the product is just fantastic. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, around assessment, Dennis, I know we wanted to just talk about that really quickly as we're winding down on time. Yeah. Um, this has been kind of the hot button issue, I think that is starting to emerge as, as people kind of have come to the conclusion that, okay, this is the way we're gonna finish our semester. So how do we then measure progress? And there's a large discussion around whether you doing the assessments you had planned to do now in an online forum is actually measuring learning or is it measuring your ability to be flexible and your students' ability to adapt in the face of a pandemic where their house is now crowded with people and they're, you know, they're they're trying to do the best they can? And you've seen in the last few days the AP or AP exams have moved to a different different length and different format. Um, you know, they're they're talking about the GRE being able to be administered at home. There's all different ways that people are coming to grips with different ways of assessment and, and what it means. I think I would encourage all of you to, to talk with your district and as your teacher team to kind of figure out what you want to do moving forward because um, some of the bigger universities have moved to SU successful, unsuccessful, pass, fail modalities because, um, you know, it's just not the same. And, and your syllabus is your syllabus to a degree, but um, you need to make this go in the favor of the student at, at this point, right? Because 
you're not necessarily assessing all of the things that you thought you would be assessing in the classroom. And so um, it, it is a deeper issue. I think we will likely have um, a post about that from our, our psychometrics and assessment folks after we've thought about it a little bit too. We wanna be really careful here, right? Because there's just so many things going on that don't pertain to learning that, um, that you know, you're, you're just not placed in the setting that you were anticipating. And I think it's, it's just, it's warrant, it warrants a lot of thoughtful um, consideration and, and, and good policy, right? So um, I, I know that's not really a great answer. I think it, it's just to expose the fact that it's much more complicated than just saying, well, make a multiple choice test and throw it out there. Um, you know, and there are secure browsers, there are different things that you can do to be sure that you're giving um, a, a quote unquote secure exam and a, a, a mostly proctored scenario. There's great companies that do different assessment lockdown tools for that. Um, but I, I would just encourage you to really be thoughtful about it. And I think um, uh, especially as goes the end of the year and progression types of exams and assessments where like the state exams are out the window at this point for most places as well. So, um, so that's kind of my, my two cents on that. I think we'll have more, more than two cents to say uh, soon, but I think it just, it warrants some more expert uh, input than, you know, that yeah. we want to just riff on. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. I think that's that's amazing and plus one, I've said that already, but plus one to you too. Uh, uh, guys, we are coming to a close here. Uh, we had some questions about special education. You can expect a, uh, a blog post on neurodiverse learning uh, best practices. Uh, we had some questions about uh, social emotional learning. Uh, we uh, That's something that Chris, Chris Ryan and I have worked on for a long time trying to incorporate that. We can definitely share some more thoughts. And Chris that. Murner, all of us. Uh, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. That's fair. Sorry. Sorry. I, I always get in trouble. All right. And then, uh, and then just say got, the Chris's just, yeah, the and Chris's. then you're covered. Yeah. There we go. There we go. And then we've got um, just, uh, we got so many questions that came in. So please keep throwing those questions in. We will definitely respond to them. Um, so I just want to thank you all. Like, uh, I'll actually want to turn it to Chris and Kristen for some final thoughts. Um, uh, but thank you for even engaging, for even listening, for even taking the time to kind of figure out what are some other things that folks are doing um, and, and seeing what steps we can take there. Uh, but yeah, uh, who wants to go first, I guess, or go last? I don't know. Uh, hard to choose to go last unless you just wait me out, Chris, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in um, to say thanks for being here now with us. And there's, there's a power of that um, that isn't the same as watching the recording and just trust that you can actually set that up. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, the leaky boat, as Chris said, but uh, you can actually make a here and now. Um, it's not going to cover everything like that you could possibly do in a face-to-face in-person classroom. But I believe this is face-to-face -to -face too. And so uh, just jump in and um, and get over the imposter syndrome, get right in there. It's going to be okay overall. I think many of us got into teaching because we love seeing that sort of, you know, aha moment from our students. And I think being on camera is the closest thing you're going to get to seeing that aha moment for the rest of the year. So encourage them to engage, lean in, um, let them see you authentically going through this um, and be the pillar for them like you are every day in the classroom. Um, there's nobody better equipped than you to see them through the rest of the year. We look forward to engaging with you from now till then um, and seeing how this uh, sort of, you know, susses out on the other end. I think it's, it's going to be better than we think right now because everybody's going to learn and grow, uh, including you. Yeah, we, we want to support you. Email us at liveonlinesupport at kaplan.com. Look for more blog posts. We are here for you. We will be responding to any questions we didn't address. Guys, this is Dennis and the Chris's signing off. Thank you for attending. Thank you for being here. We'll see you soon.